good to see you here tonight. You know, it's just good to even be here, isn't it? Amen. I pray that the Lord has spoken to your heart and you've been blessed. I think uh, that song, much more, so much more, that within itself should have blessed you if nothing else did. And I pray that you'll realize tonight that regardless of where you have come to, there's still much more. And when you get to heaven, there's still going to be more. <laughs> Amen. The Lord hasn't even uh, started, or I should say you haven't started on what he's got for you, and he's already given to you. We're delighted tonight for all of you visitors, and I pray that you will just simply let the Lord speak to your heart and just really open up to him and let him do for you what he wants to do because he is doing some things around here. He is meeting some people's needs and I haven't given him a chance to testify of the fact of what he's done for them because I haven't preached yet and uh, but I'm planning on preaching tonight and uh, I'm glad a few people are here, like Brother Bobby over there, and uh, I, I, I love to preach to these preachers, but it is a real joy to have you, and I pray that God will speak to your heart tonight, regardless if you're a member of this church or a visitor, I hope you came for the purpose of letting God speak to you. I hope you came to get changed and not entertained or enchanted, but changed. That's what the Lord is out to do with you, and that's what he plans for you. Changes you. He out to cha- he's out to change you from day to day, from victory to victory. That's what he wants to do for you tonight. And so I know that he, I know his plans. I, I just really not sure about yours, but I'd encourage you to let him have his way. And the Lord will bless you. We're, I'm grateful to have a young man here tonight that uh, visiting with us. He was here last night, and I don't know how many more times he's going to be or what his plans are, but uh, we're glad to have a young man up here, David Hill, in front. Uh, has quite a testimony, and I'm afraid if I let him get up here and testify for about 10 minutes, I never would get you down long enough to preach to you 30 minutes. So, uh, But the Lord may just open up the way. Uh, this young man, has, uh, God has really done something in his life, and you'd have to know his background to know how much God has done. And it's just amazing how the Lord saves people and really... Uh, has a tremendous testimony. And I praise the Lord for him being here tonight. He's a young evangelist, and uh, the Lord's really using him. I don't think he understands all that's going on, and I'm glad he doesn't. But uh, it's still going on, David. And God's not dead. And we're real delighted to have him. He's up from San Antonio. And... Uh, God has uh, a fantastic testimony. I asked the preacher, I said, you think I ought to mention that book that uh, David wrote because he read some of it today? <laughs> he said, Lord, it might, or I said something like this. I said, well, it might scare these people to death. He said, it might. And, but uh, it's fantastic, David. It's a tremendous book. And it's a tremendous message of how God has brought this young man in and out and a wonderful, wonderful testimony. I'm taking my time about getting in this service tonight because I'm not probably going to preach over about 25 minutes, 20 minutes, and I've been preaching about an hour, and I'm just waiting on you to settle down because I've got something to say. And you may not enjoy what I've got to say. Because when God said it to me, I certainly didn't enjoy it. And you might say, well, why, preachers? Because it was so 
profoundly different and so simple and so applicable. And that's what hurt. You know, it was so applicable to me that I didn't want to take it. And I really resisted it. As I said last night, this puts the grease to the squeak. And it's really nothing but a message on uh, what is faith. Now, I've, over, I've been preaching along this line almost every night. But this, uh, tonight, it, it, uh, is another approach. Something the Lord gave me just a few weeks ago on what is faith. A lady came to uh, me several months, years back now, I guess, and uh, she said, Preacher, said, Boy, I said, I knew just exactly what you were talking about tonight. You ever had any of them tell you that? Oh, brother, I get scared when people tell me that. And I said, She said, she said, the boy said that message on faith said, I tell you, said, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. She said, I tell you, preacher, I've got all the faith in the world. And I looked at that woman, you know, I backed off. I said, well, Lord, to myself, I said, Lord, if she's got all the faith in the world, then bless God, we'll see the dead raised tonight. And we'll see, we'll see some miracles here tonight. We'll see something happen. And I looked at her. And she just kept on talking about what faith she had. And I kept listening. And before she got through with her conversation, she turned to me and she said, Brother Beasley, would you please pray with me for my son who's lost and is not saved? I said, Lady, I thought you had all the faith in the world. I said, It'd be stupid for me to pray for your son. If you've got the faith. I said, if you've got all the faith in the world, you don't need me to pray for your son. I said, I, I need for you to pray for me, but not, not me pray for your son. If you've got all the faith in the world, because the Bible says very plainly that according to your faith, God is working. And if you've got all the faith in the world, well, you're not worried about your son getting saved. As far as you're concerned, it's settled. And you know what that lady did? She said she had faith, but her actions did not correspond with what she said. Which brings me to a scripture in the Bible that says, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and have not works? Can faith save him? Now, the Weymouth translation says it like this, and I tell you, it's tremendous. And I'm reading from James, the second chapter, the 14th verse. What, and I'll wait if you're going to turn to it till you get over there. I shouldn't have told you what verse it was. You get your attention on that and won't listen. In the Weymouth translation, it says, What good is it, my brethren? If a man professes to have faith, and yet his actions do not correspond. Well, that's something in it. And here this woman was confessing she had faith. But before she left, her actions did not correspond with her confession. And Weymouth translation says, and the King James really says it, What good is it, my brethren, if you say you have faith? And your actions do not correspond. In other words, you do not have actions that correspond with your confession. What good is it? Now, a lot of folk get confused and some great people can be blinded. And I'm sure that I have blind spots in my own life. But Martin Luther looked into the book of Romans and saw that justification was by grace through faith, not of works at all. And he was saved by grace through faith, and he saw this great truth of justification by simply trusting Jesus for salvation. And then he read the book of James, and he said it was not supposed to be in the Bible. 
You know that? Martin Luther. He said, brother, that's not supposed to be in the Bible. Because James says, faith without works is dead. And boy, this blinded Catholic man that was a priest saw that you didn't have to work and take the sacraments to be saved, that you were saved simply by grace without works. And he was so excited about it that he was blinded to what James was saying. And my dear friends, James is talking about justification before man, where Romans is talking, and Paul was talking about justification before God. And sure enough, you are justified before God by simple faith. And James is saying, if that faith is real, genuine, as the old country fellow says, genuine faith, there will be works that will prove it. And you not only will be justified before God, but you will be justified before man. So, Paul is saying that when you're really justified by faith, the same thing as James is, only one's talking about justification before God. And the other is talking about justification before man, and they're absolutely inseparable. Because if you really have genuine faith, it's real, there will be genuine corresponding action that proves that your faith is real before God. You see, if you are righteous, or if you're holy before God, you're righteous before man. If you believe with your heart, you will confess with your mouth. It's inevitable results. They're inseparable. So here, James saying, what good is it if you say that you have faith, and yet your actions do not correspond with your confession? Then your faith is not real. Now, there's another verse along that line that really gets to the heart of things. And I want to get to it in a moment. But as I want to, I want to go back now to that French uh, Bible that I quoted the other night, where it says, Roman, uh, Hebrews 11, 1, where it says, Faith is the substance of things, hope part of the evidence of things not seen. And this French Bible says that faith is rendering present that which you hope for. Let's just turn it around for simplicity's sake. That which you are hoping for, faith renders it by action as present. Oh, that's beautiful, isn't it? That thing for which you are hoping. That thing for which you are hoping. Now you realize this message is in the context of a Three other messages. Now you remember that. And hope is not faith, folk. It's just the part of it. But that thing for which you are hoping is if it's of God, then your actions are supposed to render it present. Now this is all through the Bible. For instance, at the Red Sea, Moses stood up and said, Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And then all at once he began to doubt and he said, Oh, God, do something. God said, Why callest thou on me? He said, I'm committed, brother. He said, No, you don't need to be begging me to do something. He said, When I called you and commissioned you, I committed myself to you to see you through. Some of you didn't know that, but he's committed to you. Amen. Amen. I'm not as concerned, half as concerned about my commitment to God as I am God's commitment to me. (laughs) Amen. Because I'll tell you, folks, as long as I know he's committed to me, I'm not too worried about my commitment to him. You said you're not. Aren't you trying to get us committed to God? I'm really trying to get you, or trusting God to get you, to the place where you get in such a relationship that he'll commit himself to you, and I'm not worried about the rest. If God ever starts committing himself to you, folks, the rest is the rest will take care of itself. Amen. You know, people tell me, said, man, said, I'm coming to get saved. Well, that's wonderful, folks. 
And it's wonderful when you come to Jesus to get saved. But I'll tell you what, what salvation really is. It's not when you come to Jesus to get saved. It's when you come so adequately in faith and repentance that God commits himself to you. Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew their hearts. For salvation is not you committing to Christ. Salvation is Christ committing himself to you. And folks, when you get him committed to you, you're saved. Amen. And when you get in such fellowship and relationship to Jesus that he commits himself to you. Boy, and he committed himself to this man Moses. And you know what Moses had to do? Moses had to stand up and tell over a million people to walk into the Red Sea as if there was a hole there when there wasn't a hole there, so there would be a hole there. Amen. He didn't walk out there and hit that water and open it up and said, Okay, folks, you can see the hole. Let's go through. Did he? No, he told them to march. Oh, over a million people, they believe. He, he told them to render present that which they hoped for. Of course, they had a good bit of pressure on them. They could see the dust in the background of a bunch of Egyptians coming. And there was the Red Sea in front of them. <laughs> that wasn't nothing but a desert to run in. And, and the cloud was there and the fire by, you know, night and the cloud. And they, boy, I tell you, God just shut them up to faith. And he'll do that for you if you want to trust him. Some of you hadn't realized that God's answered your prayers by giving you a problem. That's what he did for that bunch. He brought them down to a problem so he could show them how he could work. And so he brought them to the Red Sea. But I'll tell you what, Moses had to render present that which he hoped for. Boy, he had to act like it's so when it wasn't so in order for it to be so. You say, I can't understand it. You never do. The Bible says faith comes before understanding. You look in the book of Hebrews, and if you, if you start reading it, and he said... Uh, by faith we what? Understand that the world. Hey, which one says, which one comes first? Faith or understanding? You faith it and then you understand. Amen. Well, Brother Bobby, you quit trying to understand it and start faithing it. Yeah? <laughs> Amen. I know Bobby real well. He tries to understand everything before he faiths it. And uh, I can pick on him if I want to. <laughs> But I know that's all of our problems. Amen. Now, my dear friends, this man had to render present that which he hoped for. Now, you can't you see this beautiful story? And I'm just showing you a definition of what is faith. God walked out one day and said, Abraham, I'm going to make you a father of a nation. Man said, your children, I, he said, there are going to be so many. He said, you won't be able to count them. Well, Abraham said to, told Sarah, Sarah about it, and they went out and tried to help God out. They got a little program up. And God said, I'm sorry, I don't accept your program. For 20 years, he begged God to accept his program. He said, no. Well, finally, he was about 100, and his wife was almost 100, and the, the original says his body was as dead hers and boy that promise will make you a father and that ate on him that ate him up he couldn't stand it you know what that promise was the living Christ did you know that and he the question was what am I going to do with Jesus really because that's the living word and so he counted his body as though it was dead and you know what this fellow did of course, you'd send him to Terrell for this. Amen. And how some of us have stayed out acted like this, I don't know. But he went around and said, Praise God, at 100 years old, I'm a daddy. He said he did. Yet Romans 4, beginning at 17th verse. 100 years old, he said, Praise God, I'm a father. Hallelujah, I'm a father. Glory to God. I'm a father. You go check it out. He may have even gone and got a bassinet. I don't know what all he did, but the Bible said he gave glory to God. And I'll tell you what, Sarah hadn't been to the doctor. And there was no signs or evidence that she was expecting. And he 
rendered it present as though it was so. Yes, sir. That's faith. Faith renders present that which you hope for. You can go all the way through the Bible just like that. You can go on and on and on. And I could just give you one illustration right after another. On it. But now watch this. James also says, and this is where it gets down to earth. Oh, brother, this is what stings. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Now, you know what faith is? Faith is being a doer of the word of God. When God reveals, gives you his truth, you know what you're supposed to do? In spite of what you see, smell, taste, feel, and hear, the sense world, you are supposed to act on the word of God. Peter said, Lord, if that be you, bid me to come to thee. He said, come on. He got out of the boat. What was he? He was a doer of the word. And when he was a doer of the word, he so put God on the spot that God had to perform a miracle to keep his word. Right? Now, you know what faith is? It's being a doer of the word. That's simple, isn't it? But brother, that gets close to home. F.B. Meyer, the great man of God that lived, died, I suppose, what, about 60, 70 years ago? But you've probably read after him, at least you preachers have. Was awakened one early morning. And he looked out his window and he saw a, a light on in a, another room in the same hotel. And he recognized that it was a room that was occupied by a young man by the name of C.T. Studd. Now, when C.T. Studd got saved and surrendered his all to Jesus, he gave away what would be equal to over a million dollars today. Just gave it away. You know why? Because he wanted to trust Jesus and learn to trust him. His last $20,000 he gave to the girl that he was going to marry. And they were married in China as missionaries. And when they got married, she still had that $20,000. And she came in one day and she said, well, said, here's that $20,000. He said, oh, I gave that to you. said, I gave away everything I had. And said, I gave you the last $20,000. She said, well, since we're married, we're one. So what God told you, I have to obey. So here's the $20. Give it to somebody else. And man, they, they had nothing left but Jesus. And he was a fantastic fellow. A marvelous man of God. And F.B. Meyer <coughs> saw him up. And so up in the day, F.B. Meyer ran into C.T. Studd. Now listen to this. And said, uh, Brother Studd said, I noticed that you were up this morning around 4.35. And I noticed you were reading. Said, if I'm not being too inquisitive, said, what were you doing? He said, Doctor, he said, I was up looking through the pages of the Bible to find a scripture that commanded me to do something that I wasn't doing. Because the Bible says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And he said, I was looking through the word to just find a scripture that I could obey to let Jesus know that I love him. Oh, brother. What about that? Be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. You know what's wrong, folk? For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass, and he beholdeth himself, and go his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. That's exactly what's happening in our churches. We hold the word of God up and people sit there and contemplate it, rationalize it, then come humanize it, and then folks, they go out and they forget about what kind of person they were. Not a doer of the word. 
They appreciate it. They love it. They are sent to it. They say it's great, but brother, they do not obey it. I don't know about you, but this convicts me as much as anything I've ever got a hold of in my life. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty or the word of God and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, of the word, a doer, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. Isn't that beautiful? You know what faith is? It's obeying the word. I'll tell you what we need to do tonight is quit loving the devil. Why, Brother Manley, I don't love the devil. No, you don't. You don't love the devil? I mean, now, I know you wouldn't agree with me that you love the devil. But I don't think you'd even agree with yourself. Well, let's see if you love the devil. Now, how does the Bible teach us to love Jesus? By saying, Jesus, I love you? By saying, Jesus, I love you? Is that the way? No. He said, if you love me, you'll do whatsoever I can have. So how do you love Jesus tonight? By doing what his word says do. Well then, if that's the way you love Jesus, if you do what the devil says do, then who do you love? Come on, I, I, I see here. You say, well, that brother man, I, oh, excuse me, folks, I forgot that you're human. You need to let God's word do God's word, folks. You need to face the issue that when you do what the devil wants you to do, you love it. On the same principle that that is the same way you love God. Right? Now, folks, we need to quit loving the devil. I know in the human sense you don't love it. But in a living reality, in the sense of doing, the sense of obedience, who do you really love? I wish I could get you out of this emotional stuff and intellectual stuff and get you in with God. Hey, say, have you ever looked at this portion of Scripture? Matthew, the seventh chapter. Now, this really got a hold of me. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, I'll give them Matthew 7, chapter 24th verse. Listen to it. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I've, I, I, I've used that all my life, haven't you? Haven't you used that as a little song? Build this house upon a rock, and all built this house upon the sand about the man, haven't you? Well, let's listen to it. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken to him, or like him unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock. Who is the man that's wise? Is a man who hears the sayings of God and what? Doeth them. Obeys them. You know, the word faith is only mentioned twice in the Old Testament. It's obeyed back there. Same thing. Faith in the Old Testament is obeyed. Same as the New Testament. Faith and believing in the New Testament is obeyed. Old Testament, faith, is word, obey, is belief. As you just reverse it. But beloved, listen. He says, listen. And the rains descend, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and the beat upon the house, and it fell not, and it was, for it was founded upon the rock. Why isn't that beautiful? Who is the wise man who hears the sayings of God and obeys them? What is faith? It's obeying the word of God. I couldn't make it any simpler than that. Let's see the unwise man. Everyone that heareth these things of mine and doeth them not shall be likened to a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rains descended, and floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. 
You know, you, you have men and women in churches that grow up. You know, say, by the way, did you know the, the length of time that the average professed Christian today that's baptized in a Baptist church uh, will attend actively? That is on fire, what people consider a on fire involved Christian. You know how long they'll last? Five years. Did you know that? Five years is average. And you know what happens today? And we get all upset about these storms, don't we, in our life. But folks, let me tell you something. If you're a doer of the Word, you'll stand in the storm. And when the storms come and you watch out, it's obvious that your faith is not real. Boy, I tell you what, I'm not for divorces and I'm not for a lot of things that's going on. But these men and women have these storms to hit their, their homes and blow them up. And I've been in the ministry long enough to find out that 15 to 20 years on down the road or 10 years, let's God those people to come back and repent and get saved and get straightened out. And it would have never happened to them if the storms had not exposed the fact that their faith was not real in the beginning. And I almost had to thank God for it. And that's hard to say, but it's still true. You know that? Yes, sir. I got so tickled at the different people's opinions about why I got sick. Some said you stand against God. Some said this, and some said that. And it doesn't make me a different what they say. I don't it just I just make me a difference. And uh, the thing that's so fascinating about it is this. I've gone, all, I've gone all over this world, all over this country, preaching, boy, that your faith in Christ will stand in the test. And the greatest thing I know, folks, is up to this point it stood the test. See, up to this point it stood the test. I don't know, that may not make you feel good, but it sure helps me. <laughs> to see that. I never saw that before. That faith is being a doer of the Word of God. Now, isn't that a simple definition of faith? Is you hear the Word, and like C.T. Studd, you hear it, and it's not operating in your life, and so immediately you say, Well, Lord, that spoke to me tonight. Then right there on that spot, you act on the person of Jesus, the living Word of God, and say, now, Lord, I'm so trusting you, stepping out on the water like Peter, that you've got to convert the truth of this book into reality in my life. And, folks, that is faith. In fact, I wrote a statement down here. Faith is action that converts doctrine or truth into reality. Amen. That's why folk don't believe us too much. It's because we say God's real and they can't see the reality. They just hear our words. We confess one thing, but there's no corresponding action. Now, let's get a little closer to home. This is a testimony. I went to North Carolina one time to a camp meeting with a friend. And now when I was in this camp meeting and about, oh, about, I think 1,200 people there. And if you've never been to one of those Baptist camp meetings in South Carolina, you missed that. You missed one of the nine wonders of the world, no doubt, uh, about it. It's unusual. It's quite different than anything you normally will see. And they're quite expressive. And uh, what I mean is they believe in shouting. And I mean they don't only believe in it, they practice it. <laughs> and of course, I wouldn't say it was all of the Lord, but uh, they still do it, brother. I, I mean, they shout. I've seen a thousand people shouting at one time. And I mean, they were Baptists, too. They didn't have to go get Pentecostals to shout for them. They do their own shouting. And so they, boy, it was something... 
So they, I was in this meeting, I was just a visitor, and I wasn't known there. And I was in this meeting, and there they decided to take an offering. And the preacher got up and said, Now, folks, said, who will give $20 here tonight? And boy, as he started begging for the offering, I got sick. Now, I had $8 in my pocket, and I was 700 miles away from home. And that day, I had left my shaving equipment. And I knew I had to replace that before I could preach in the revival starting the next day. So I asked the Lord what part of that $8 he'd have me to give. A $5 bill, $3. So I asked the Lord about the 3 and the 5 and he wouldn't say a word. So the man just kept begging for the money, got down to $10, and then he said, who'll give 5 Well, I went with the preacher that was to be there the next week. And everyone knew him. He was born and reared in that area. And all of those people knew him. And they knew he didn't have any money. And he was just a poor preacher. And so he got up and said, I'll give five. Well, Lord, when he did that, then those women got to squalling and bawling because their little darling preacher had given five dollars. And they took up a $250 sympathy offering. God didn't have a thing to do with it. And so, when that got through... Of all things, they asked me to come up and pray. Well, sometimes I'm pretty mean. And I said, when I got up there, I said, Folk, I could no more pray over that offering than I could get to the moon tonight because God didn't take it. He said, well, you don't offend those people. I'd rather offend them and please God than, than not do it, I'll tell you. So I just told him I wouldn't pray. But the Holy Spirit showed me what to do. And I said, Lord, I said, hey, when he showed me, I said, Lord, I can't do that. He said, oh, yes, you can. And I said, now, folk, listen, do you believe this Bible? And as I said, they are quite expressive. And I said, do you believe the word of God and that God will, God watches over his word to perform it? Boy, now, when you get something going like that, that bunch of get with you. I mean, they, they just throw up their hands and say, Hallelujah, praise God, amen. Well, I'm not a psychologist, but I knew where I was headed and what I was going to do. And I, I knew this, that the Lord told me to do it. And boy, I just let them just praise God over that statement. That God will keep his word and he watches over it to perform it. Oh, they shouted. I mean, they really went at it. Just glorious. <laughs> well, the next step was this. I said, well, if you believe God keeps his word. I said, uh, I'd like to share a couple of testimonies with you. And one of the testimonies I gave, and I gave a couple, but one of them was about how when uh, George Mueller came down for breakfast one morning with a thousand kids and didn't have any food, he told the kids to sit down, turn their plates over, and bow their heads, and thank God for food that wasn't there. And I said, as they prayed and thanked God for food that wasn't there, the doorbell rang, and there was a man at the door, and he had delivered some hot food somewhere, and something went wrong, and they couldn't take it, so he just brought it by there, and it was hot, and they just brought it right off the wagon, right in there, and said, don't take it. And I said, how would you like to see God do that again? Don't you believe he can do it? Hallelujah, they went up again. And then I just let them really get involved. You know, really got involved. So then uh, I said something like this. I said, now, folk, you know God watches over his word to perform it. He'll keep it. And... Uh, I said, not only that, but uh, you'd like to see God do that for you, something like that for you, wouldn't you? Boy, here they went again. And folks, that is right. They wanted God to do something for them. And they were honest about it, don't you? Aren't you tired of people just standing up and telling you what Jesus has done for them? Oh, I love to see people get so sick in meetings that they just get so mad and sick, they just said, Preacher, I'm tired of you telling about what God's done for you. I'll tell you, he's got to do something for me. 
Oh, I love to see people get like that. And boy, they got excited. I said, all right, if you want God to do something for you, I said, the thing you have to do is get out there where he knew it. And I said, he watches over his word to perform. Lord, yes, amen, praise God. I really let them express themselves, and I'm cutting the short story short. I just really let them on. And, and I got them out there, and I said, now turn with me, please, to the word of God. And I turned to a little verse, and I'm not going to give you the chapter and verse uh, at this point, but I will if you want it, if you don't know where it is. I said, the Bible says, and I gave it to them, though, and I had them to read it. It says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Press down, shaken together. And running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with them, it shall be measured to you again. I said, How many of you believe that's the word of God? And before they thought, they shouted again. And I said, Now what does God say? I said, God says, if you give, he'll take it, he'll press it down, shake it together, and then turn around and call men to give back to you. I said, now, folks, that is the word of God. And I said, you want God to do something for you. Don't do what you can afford to do, but take that grocery check. Don't give it to this camp meeting. This camp meeting doesn't need it. But I said, give it to the Lord. And step out on that promise. Be a doer of that word. Just take that one verse right tonight. Don't worry about doing any rest of it. Just do that one verse. One verse at a time to do you. Come on, folks. You get quiet and I don't blame you. <laughs> but, folks, listen now. All I'm telling you is what is one verse at a time to do this. Come on, folks, you're getting quiet and I don't blame you. <laughs> but folks, listen now. All I'm telling you is what is faith. I said now. Faith is so acting on God's word that he has to perform on it. And I said, you want to be able to have a living spirit where God can bring the truth in the reality? I said, now, be a doer of the word of God. Let your actions correspond to your faith. He said, what happened? Preacher, it got quiet. It got still. In fact, it got like that. You see, folks, we're just playing church. We're just fiddling around. We don't no more believe God. Because God watches over his word to perform. And all he's waiting on is you to obey his word so he can perform it. You can tell me you've got faith all day until you obey this truth. You're just playing games. You might as well quit and get out in the ballpark with the rest of the unbelievers. Let the world know where you stand. Because you're sure acting like a hypocrite sitting in here amongst all these believers. Of course, my opinion is most of us aren't as much believers as we think we are. <laughs> Amen? You know what happened, folks? In a few minutes, and those people don't make money like they do out here. Most of those homes in North Car in Carolina and most places in that particular area, both man and wife had to work to make as much as the average person makes around this country. But just the man working. And I saw women, and I saw men step out on that truth, become a doer of it. They took several thousand dollars off in that night. It broke loose. And when I got, when the offering got through, God said, Okay, now, son, you preached your sermon. 
He said, man, why don't you practice what you preach? I said, well, Lord, I've got to get to church for him. You know, I've got to have that shaving kit. He said, eight dollars. Eight dollars. He said, now you be a doer of the word and not a hearer on He said, I'll have to perform a miracle for you to get you to church in the morning, shaved and cleaned up. I tell you, it's easy to preach, folks. More difficult to practice. But God took it. And I gave that offering that night. Not to that camp meeting. They didn't need that offering. But to the, to the adieu of the word. And you know what happened? Before I left that place that night, a man walked up. He said, Preacher, I hope you won't think I'm stupid. Now, I didn't tell people what I was doing. They didn't know what I was predicting when I was in. I was stepping out on the work. I never told a soul. He said, Preacher, God told me tonight that you had need of some shaving equipment. And said, I had a brand new outfit right out in my glove compartment, and God told me you needed it. He said, Here you are. I wasn't off. I was big for that. And really, I wasn't known. Probably, I wasn't known personally by three or four people there. And when I got to my room that night, I had $40 in my pocket. <laughs> Bible says be a doer of the way. And not a only. Now, I just gave you one scripture uh, about, about a material thing. I could give you more about spiritual matters. You see, this book is to be converted into reality in my life. And you know how it's converted into reality in our life? I said it a while ago, by faith. And faith is nothing but obeying the Word of God. And when you get the word from God, then all you've got to do is step out on his word. That's what Peter did. Lord, if that be you, bid me to come to thee. And he said, come on. And what did he do? He obeyed the word. Right? He obeyed the word. And then there he went out and walked on water. And that's the most ridiculous story in the Bible. No logical reason for it, no apparent reason, except if you understand that Jesus was out to teach his disciples one thing by, by practice. He taught them doctrine, but he was out to teach them one thing most of all. And that was to trust him. Because you see, Jesus never performed a miracle. Oh, you said he did, preacher. Oh, no. Jesus always allowed the Father by faith to do it through him. Right? Now, you can say he performed miracles, sure. But he really, in essence, let the Father do it through him. So when he left, as the Father has sent me, and he said, I live by the Father, therefore I want to teach you to live by me. So as the Father has sent me, so send I you. To live how? As I depended on the Father, then I want you to depend on me. As the Father worked miracles through me, now I want to be able to work miracles through you. And how was it? Jesus was, was the greatest man of faith I ever saw. He's the greatest man of faith in the Bible. Jesus was? Yes. He said, uh, Philip, how are you going to feed these 5,000 men? Tell him, let me check, let me check. I got forty dollars, Lord. He acted just like an atheist, as I told him another one, right? If Jesus said, Ask an atheist, sir, how are you gonna feed these forty thousand these five thousand men? What would that atheist have done? Checked on his bank account. And Phelps acted just like an atheist. You know what he did? He flunked the coin. And Jesus knew what he was gonna say, but he 
he put him in that predicament to show Peter, uh, excuse me, Philip, that he didn't have any faith. And to teach his men how to trust him. Now, if you don't think God, Jesus put God on the spot, folks, he put those men, he said, put them in groups. And they brought those little old fish and those little old loaves of bread. But he had that bunch already feet. I mean, they were acting. I mean, they were already feet. They were ready And he said, thank you, Lord. I'm breaking that fish. And Lord, it's starting to multiply. If God hadn't performed the miracle, what kind of predicament would he have been in? You say, yes, but picture Jesus was the Son of God. My dear friend, you forget that by, that Jesus Christ and his work on this earth, even though he was the Son of God, he was the Son of Man. Yes. And my dear friends, he would not have been a perfect example for you and me if he had not been tested and tempted and cried. Every victory he had over the devil did not come because he was divine. It became, it came because he was filled with the Father, the Spirit of God. For if that had not been the case, he would not have said, No man has seen the Father. Except that he's seen him in me. And no man has seen God at any time. You see? And he would have been acting from the basis of God rather than acting from the basis of a man full of God. And this is why he didn't perform a miracle. He allowed the Father to do it through him. And do you know the poverty of your need tonight? And the magnitude of the opportunity or the potential of the blessing out under, my dear friends, has nothing to do with whether the need and the supply is met. You know what the key is? The blessings of the Father on it. For when Jesus blessed those few fishes, it met the need. And you may have nothing tonight to offer. There may be a fantastic need out there. If you get the blessings of Jesus on it, brother, it'll meet the need. He sure will. You talking about Jesus putting somebody on the spot. He said, come forth, Lazarus. And if God hadn't raised that fellow from the dead, he'd been so. Wasn't it? And all Jesus was doing was this. He said, Father, you know what I'm doing? It's what I see you do. I get your word there, and I do it down here. He was obedient to what? The word. He said, that's all I'm doing is just moving heaven and earth. Amen. I see what you want, and I obey it. Obey the word. It becomes reality down here. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. Well, you wake up one of these days and find out, folks, we missed it. So much, so many times, right? Oh, brother. Oh, man. Be ye a doer of the word and not a hearer only. How'd you get saved? It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. As many as come to him, I'll in no wise cast out. As many as received him to them, gave you the power to become the sons of God. And you know what? That came a moment in your life. You did what? You obeyed the word. And when you obeyed the word, what happened? You saved him. Amen? Well, if you got saved that way, the Bible says you're supposed to spend the rest of your life walking that way. That's the simplest definition of faith I can give you. I don't think you can make it any more simple than that. And tonight, folks, if you're tired of just being blessed and benefited, and you want God to do something for you personally, let God get you so sick of yourself that you're just admiring and assenting and over the Word of God, and the fact that you receive it as a doctor, and you start obeying it. And you start obeying the truth. And God will convert that truth into reality in your life. You know what happened in that camp meeting? That poor preacher didn't get to preach. Just a few times. You say, why, Brother Manley? Well, my friends, what do you think? Here's a woman gives all her grocery money. And boy, if God doesn't perform a miracle, she's fine. And then you know what Man always wants someone unannounced. 
No one told anybody what happened. And here somebody brings a bag of groceries back to a person that should normally have plenty. And man, I tell you, God started working miracles for the for these men and women all over that camp meeting. And bless God, they get down to that church that night and they say, wait, please, I gotta say something. I, I just gotta say something. I can't stand it. You can't keep me shut up any longer. I'll tell you the rest of Christ did something for me today. And they got so excited about what the Lord was doing for them, he couldn't get up and preach. He'd take the service over. And my dear friends, they, you start magnifying the resurrected Christ and talking about what Jesus is really doing in you, and it electrifies the place, and the Holy Spirit takes over, brother. I say, you, that bunch had something to say, and they couldn't shut up. Amen? You know why we're all so quiet? We're dead. And we're dumb. We're like John the Baptist. John the Baptist said, God said, call him John. John wasn't, uh, John, uh, daddy wasn't, John the Baptist's daddy, excuse me. God said to John the Baptist's daddy, said, call him John. And by the way, you know when he got his gear in and he talked about it? When he called John John. Amen. <laughs> when he became a sure of the word of God. He said, I'm going to call him John. <laughs> John said, call him John. I'm going to call him John. And what he did, John. He had something to say. And folks, when we are not doers of the word, we forget what we look like and we go off and we become deaf to God and when you're deaf to God you're done before man you have nothing to say but boy when he speaks then you got something to say now tell me will you be a doer of the word or just a hear on how long will you look at that mirror and see yourself and then walk away and forget what you look like. How long? Well, it's between you and God, folk. I can't help you. I've helped you all I could. Would you bow your head, please?